uh, the twister space. Uh, of complexified Minkowski spacetime, four-dimensional complexified Minkowski spacetime, uh, was this open subset of three-dimensional complex projective space, um, written in terms of uh, homogeneous coordinates ZA, which we divided up into two uh, SL2 vial, vial spinners of uh, opposite chirality these homogeneous, holomorphic homogeneous coordinates on CP3, such that the, the last two, these lambda alpha guys, uh, were not allowed to be simultaneously vanishing. And these two uh, spaces are related by these incidence relations. Which tell us that a point uh, in complexified Minkowski space is uh, equal to a linearly embedded holomorphic Riemann sphere in the twister space. And the, by the converse, a point in the twister space gives a totally null uh, two-plane uh, in Minkowski spacetime. So OK, so today we're going to hopefully start trying to learn a bit of the, the magic of this somewhat simple correspondence. Uh, and the thing we're going to talk about is how these basic facts allow us to start generating solutions to interesting partial differential equations uh, in physics. So what are these partial differential equations? So that we're going to be talking about uh, certain massless free fields in complexified Minkowski spacetime, which are often called zero rest mass fields, or ZRM fields. So uh, what are these things? These are, uh, well, let's start with uh, by considering uh, totally symmetric uh, SL2 spinner fields say I can have a phi with 2s symmetric undotted spinner indices. The reason for this choice of 2s will become apparent soon. Uh, and I can have also ones that have uh, a symmetric set of dotted uh, spinner indices. And we demand that these things are conformal densities of weight Minus one. So what does that mean? In real money? So in real money, uh, that means that under a conformal transformation, which we've been hearing lots about, uh, under a conformal transformation of the Minkowski metric, let's say eta AB goes to omega squared eta AB. Or if you like, in the SL2 spinner language that we introduced uh, yesterday, this Minkowski metric is given by two two-dimensional Levi-Civita symbols. So that conformal transformation is the same as saying epsilon alpha beta goes to omega epsilon alpha beta and epsilon alpha dot beta dot goes to omega epsilon alpha dot beta dot. So we want these symmetric spinner fields to transform as phi alpha 1 alpha 2s goes to omega minus 1 phi alpha 1 alpha 2s phi twiddle alpha dot 1 alpha dot 2s goes to omega minus 1 phi twiddle alpha dot 1 alpha dot 2s. So we now say that these totally symmetric spinner fields are what we call zero rest mass fields if they obey the following uh, partial differential equations. We say that these guys are zero rest mass fields 
if, so first let's state the equation for the undotted uh, symmetric spinner ones. D alpha one alpha dot phi alpha one to phi alpha two s is equal to zero, where d alpha alpha dot, this is just shorthand for d by dx alpha alpha dot. So I take a space-time derivative of the spinner field, and then I contract on one of the undotted spinner indices. It doesn't matter which one, because it's totally symmetric. And for the dotted uh, guys, we just do the opposite thing. We contract on one of the dotted indices. So let's say alpha alpha dot one, phi twiddle. And in the case where s is equal to 0, we just ask that the field satisfies the massless scalar wave equation. Okay. So these things are what are called the zero rest mass equations. Uh, and fields, totally symmetric spinner fields that are conformal de densities of weight minus 1, which satisfy these equations, are zero rest mass fields. Now, uh, why should you care about <laughs> such fields? Well, it's clear when s is equal to 0 that these are just massless free scalars. So those are things that uh, we like to study. And when s is equal to 1, and there's just one uh, spinner index on the dotted or undotted field, then these are just the massless vial neutrino equations. But more generally, for any s, these are the massless free field equations that you would know and love for any massless free field. So it's perhaps not immediately obvious why that's the case. Um, so let's see why explicitly for s equal 1. But uh, actually, before, before we do that, I should explain one other thing, which is why uh, we demand these things to be conformal densities of weight minus 1. It has a nice, um, nice consequence that uh, the ZRM equations are in fact conformally invariant. Do you mean conformally covariant or conformally invariant? I mean uh, in the sense that if you solve the equation in one conformal frame, the conformally transformed solution solves the zero rest mass equations in the other conformal frame. It's conformally covariant, but there's a zero on one side of the equation. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> co in. So why is this the case? So uh, by, by definition, these things are supposed to transform as uh, conformal densities of weight minus 1. Let's just show it for the undotted zero rest mass fields. So under a conformal transformation, let's say we have the conformally transformed field. I'll put a hat on top of it. And by definition, this is just omega minus 1 uh, of the unconformally transformed uh, field. And let nabla hat alpha alpha dot be the levy chivita connection of uh, the conformally transformed metric g hat omega squared eta. Then uh, after a bit of sort of algebra, you can convince yourself, hopefully, that the following relation holds. I'll leave this as an, as an exercise. So this is just using the, the definition of the zero rest mass field as a conformal density of weight minus 1, and then working out what the action oops, sorry, of the conformally transformed levy chivita connection is on this quantity. And a straightforward calculation will give you the following.
I'll explain my notation here in a moment. Where this quantity epsilon, this is equal to omega to the minus k over k d alpha alpha dot omega to the k. Um, and this is true for all uh, integer k. Well, let's say uh, not equal to zero. Okay, so this is a this is a straightforward calculation. You can hopefully do that on your own and convince yourself that it's true. Um, so now we want to see that we're getting the conformally invariant zero rest mass equation automatically satisfied in the new conformal frame by virtue of the fact that the so It's, it, won't, it won't be true that the equation is held for conformal weight minus 2. So this is not the zero rest mass equation that I've written, right? <laughs> there, are no, there are no indices contracted here. So what we need to do is contract two of these indices and see that we get zero. And this is not, this will not be true. You see, so I haven't, I haven't contracted these indices yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, of course, this is, this is a tautology, right? This is just a definition, if you like. So now what we need to do is show that we're going to get, so what we want to see. I mean the levy chivita connection of this metric. Okay, but it's acting on what? On phi hat. Okay, and phi is tensor value, it's inner value, mm -hmm. it's also the density. Yes. Mm -hmm. Covariant derivative knows that the, the, the density. Indeed. And it knows it because it will act on this right. omega. So, so it just keeps it commutative? Mm, I don't think so. I mean, you, you, you could, of course, put any number here, m, right? And you will get an expression, right? Again, just by a straightforward calculation. But we haven't shown anything yet. What we need to show is that when we contract with the conformally rescaled epsilons here, we get zero. And for generic number here, this next equality is not true. There'll be some other terms you have to write down. And it will not be the case that you get zero. So only for minus one will this be true. I'm not, I feel like I'm not answering your question, but uh, I mean, the, 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 these two equalities, I mean, this equality isn't anything. It's just using the definition. And this equality is just working out, uh, write down the levy chivita connection of this metric, work out how it acts, and this is what you get. I mean, that's the thing that at the end of the day will make it work for you, yeah. Yeah, so you can, I guess, break the parity of the Lorentz group. You can do something very unnatural. Uh, yeah, but as long as I make an egalitarian uh, distribution of the conformal weights on each of the SL2 bundles, then um, this, is, this is the only thing I'm allowed to do. So in particular, if I contract both sides uh, of this equation with uh, omega minus 2 epsilon beta alpha 1 epsilon beta dot alpha dot, then what you'll get is the following. You'll get omega 1 nabla hat alpha 1 alpha dot phi alpha 1 up to alpha 2s hat is equal to omega minus 2 d 
D alpha 1 alpha dot phi alpha 1 up to alpha 2 s minus upsilon alpha 1 alpha dot phi alpha 1 alpha 2 up to alpha 2 s minus epsilon alpha 1 alpha dot phi alpha 1 alpha 2 s. So you might wonder what happened to all the other terms here. So here we have a sum over all the different ways of taking one of the undotted indices on this guy and putting it on this quantity epsilon. But for all the other terms in this expression where alpha 1 uh, isn't appearing here, I end up contracting between spinners down here. This is totally symmetric. The contraction always happens via the levy chivita symbol, so that's zero. So in the end, we only pick up the contraction where alpha 1 is here, and it contracts onto here, and then the contraction, um, sorry, so those, those, are the, those are the only contractions that can appear. So here we have uh, one contraction between an upstairs alpha 1 on this upsilon kind of conformal factory thing, and a downstairs alpha 1 on the, the zero rest mass field. And here it's the same contraction the other way around. So I can put this index upstairs and this index downstairs at the expense of a sign. Right? This is one of these important things to always keep in the back of your mind when you're doing this SL2 spinner yoga. The contractions are anti-symmetric because they happen via the levi chivita symbol. So now these two terms cancel with each other. And we're just left with this. So what you get is alpha 1, alpha dot. The conformally transformed uh, zero rest mass equation is just proportional to the zero rest mass equation back in Minkowski space, which is zero. So this is the sense in which it's a conformal uh, conformally covariant, I guess you were asking about this before, there's a minus three here, but it's zero. So in some sense, the, the point is you solve the equation in one conformal frame, you solved it in all of them. Um, and just to get back to some of the earlier questions, if I picked a different conformal weight for the zero rest mass field, like I said, I would generate many other terms here, which would give non-vanishing, other non-vanishing contributions when I came through and contracted with epsilons here, and they wouldn't all cancel. So you can you can work that out for yourself as an exercise if you like. Yes. Sorry, I have a computer implementation. No, sorry. Yeah, thank you for calling me out on this. So here, what this notation means is I take the ith alpha index and I replace it with a beta, and then that ith alpha index is appearing on the epsilon. Sorry, that's that's what it means. Other questions at this point? Okay. Okay, so I mean you can uh, amuse yourself by seeing that this also works of course for the dotted ones and it's actually slightly more non-trivial to see what happens in the scalar case, although uh, you know, maybe you can guess. So, uh, so let's see, uh, how do we see that the zero rest mass equations are sort of the same as the, the massless free field equations. So just a bit of a, um, a teaser for why you should be caring about this. If you want to consider calculating massless scattering amplitudes, which is something that Tom's been telling us about, remember you, you have some endpoint process and the external legs in this process are defined by LSZ truncation. And that just means putting these external legs on shell, which means they have to solve the massless free field equations. So generating solutions to these equations, you can think of it as generating external wave functions for some massless scattering process. So it's something uh, you want to care about if you're, um, if you're in the business of computing scattering amplitudes, particularly massless scattering amplitudes. So, um, so let's, let's see this. explicitly uh, for spin one, uh, which is the, the case that Tom's been, been, been telling us about in the mornings in any case. So, um, 
So here, let's uh, let uh, a or a alpha alpha dot be uh, a Maxwell field. And then its field strength, Cajun variant field strength in the two spinner formalism is some object f alpha alpha dot beta beta dot, which is just the derivative uh, with respect to x alpha alpha dot of a beta beta dot minus the other way around. Right? So now, um, because this thing, so again, if you wanted to write this in sort of four vector notation, you'd call this fab. And by the usual yoga of replacing every four index with a pair of SL2 spinner indices, this is how you, you would write it. Now, uh, as by construction, this thing is anti-symmetric. There's sort of two different ways that can be the case when you write it in terms of SL2 spinners. Either it's anti-symmetric under interchange of the undotted spinners, or it's anti-symmetric under interchange of the dotted spinners. It can't be both, or else it would be symmetric and it, uh, in, in, in kind of tensorial language. Right? So this means that either f alpha alpha dot beta beta dot is skew under uh, interchange of the undotted spinner indices, uh, or uh, it's skew under interchange of the dotted spinner indices. And I mean, this is exclusively, or it can't be both. So keeping in mind, uh, one of the lessons hopefully from yesterday was that anytime you have a skew symmetric object in two dimensions, it has to be proportional to the levi civita symbol. Um, we can do this decomposition into these two, uh, if you like, irreducibles quite straightforwardly. Um, define f alpha beta to be one half f alpha gamma dot beta gamma dot and f twiddle alpha dot beta dot to be equal to one half f gamma alpha dot gamma beta dot. So uh, here I raise and contract spinner indices using the conventions that we wrote down uh, yesterday. And then it's uh, straightforward to show that you can decompose f alpha alpha dot whoops, beta beta dot as epsilon alpha dot beta dot f alpha beta plus epsilon alpha beta f twiddle alpha dot beta dot. And you can check, if you like, as an exercise that this is consistent by plugging in these definitions and playing with uh, contracting things with epsilons and using the conventions that we, we wrote down uh, yesterday. Now, you might say, okay, what have you uh, gained by all of this? Well, one thing to observe is that uh, under Hodge duality. So that's um, just fancy words for taking the dual of the electromagnetic field strength. So we just contract with the Levi Civita, uh, four dimensional Levi Civita symbol. You can show that what you get here is actually I times epsilon gamma delta gamma dot delta dot minus the epsilon gamma dot delta dot f gamma delta, where gamma gamma dot are the two spinner indices I associate with the four vector index C, delta delta dot are the two spinner indices that I uh, associate with D. So sometimes I will write equations like this which seem uh, like they don't make any sense, but I trust you to be able to translate from four vector to two spinner stuff uh, from one side to the other. So what this means is that this quantity uh, f twiddle is self-dual uh, under electromagnetic duality. 
and the quantity f uh, alpha beta is anti-self-dual. So that's why there's this relative minus sign here. So one of the advantages of working in this two-spinner formalism is it gives you an explicit decomposition into self-dual and anti-self-dual parts uh, of, 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 a, of a field string. So we say f alpha beta is the anti-self dual or ASD field strength and F twiddle alpha dot beta dot is the self dual. Yes? The I factor is there because we're working in Lorentzian signature. So the notion of Hodge duality comes with a factor of i in Lorentzian signature. If I was in Euclidean signature, that factor of i wouldn't be there, and it would literally be plus and minus. But yeah, because uh, we've set everything up in complexified, I mean, because everything's complexified, it's sort of all up for grabs anyway. Um, we, could, we could instead work with a Euclidean metric and say that the Lorentzian real slice involves some different reality conditions, and then this i wouldn't be there. But because we want to have kind of Lorentzian reality conditions in the back of our minds, that's, that's why the i is there. Uh, yeah, so then we call uh, the undotted bit, or sorry, the dotted bit the self-dual field strength. And that's just because of these, uh, these relative signs. So one thing that um, follows, oh, that's useless, isn't it? One thing that follows relatively immediately from this is a nice observation, which is that any time you have a Maxwell field, which is purely self-dual, or purely, sorry, any time you have a, a U1 gauge field that is, whose field strength is purely self-dual or anti-self-dual, that gauge field automatically solves the Maxwell equation. So um, it's quite uh, enlightening to see why, I think. So uh, in these two spinner variables, uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, vacuum Maxwell equations are just d beta alpha dot f twiddle alpha dot beta dot plus d alpha beta dot f alpha beta equals zero. And uh, if I set, uh, and, and we also have the Bianchi identity, which is d beta alpha dot f twiddle alpha dot beta dot minus d alpha beta dot f alpha beta dot whoop, beta is equal to zero. So if you set, say, f alpha beta equals to zero, then you cover up this term in the Maxwell equation, and then the Maxwell equation is just the same as the Bianchi identity, and the Bianchi identity is non-dynamical. You get that for free uh, by knowing that this f came as the field strength of a gauge potential. So so you automatically solve Maxwell. And similarly, if you were to set f twiddle alpha dot beta dot equal to zero. So self-dual, purely self-dual or purely anti-self-dual gauge fields automatically solve, uh, abelian gauge fields automatically solve Maxwell's equations. Um, May I ask please. Can Yes, I mean, so you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're one step ahead of us. So what you can show is that this object and this object are both conformal densities of weight minus one, right? Okay. So then you repeat the calculation from before. Yes, exactly. Very good. Um, so uh, let, let's think about how this all might look in real money. Um, so suppose uh, we want to 
consider uh, like photon wave functions. So for just for concreteness, let's consider a positive helicity a photon. Um, luckily, my conventions agree with Tom uh, on, on this, so hopefully this, uh, we, won't, we won't get too confusing here. This is going to end in a momentum eigenstate representation. This will be some linearized gauge potential A alpha alpha dot. I keep this plus up there to remind us that it's supposed to be positive helicity. And uh, this thing is going to look like some polarization vector E to the I k dot x. For k, a null four momentum, the momentum of the photon, that means it can be decomposed into two, two spinners, which I'll call kappa alpha and kappa twiddle alpha dot. These are the exact same things that Tom was writing down uh, this morning and yesterday. And let's let this positive helicity polarization vector be B alpha kappa twiddle alpha dot over B kappa. But remember, this angle bracket is shorthand for contracting uh, using the levy chivita symbol, the two undotted spinner indices here. And B is just some arbitrary constant two spinner. Okay? So you might worry, you know, who ordered this? Isn't this introducing some extra physical degrees of freedom into the photon wave function? The answer is no, it isn't. Ugh. So, so also for, for the organizers, there's there was some plan to have a picture taken at 110. How, how seriously should I take this plan? <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Okay, yeah, so I will proceed until stopped. Um, Okay, so uh, so observe first of all that k dot epsilon plus is equal to zero. So we're in Lorentz gauge. So why is that? If I come along and I contract this thing with k, that's contracting with kappa alpha kappa twiddle alpha dot. But it means I'm going to contract kappa twiddle with itself by a skew symmetric inner product. So that's zero. So we're in Lorentz gauge. And changing the choice of this constant spinner B alpha, dot, uh, B alpha gives, so let's take B alpha kappa twiddle alpha dot over B kappa. And let's take the difference with some other B, say B prime alpha kappa twiddle alpha dot B prime kappa. So let's put everything over a common denominator so you get. Now you use this uh, magical identity called the, Scout, the Scouten identity, which is just telling you that any three vectors in two dimensions have to be linearly dependent. Right? So what are the three vectors we're going to use? We're going to use B, B prime, and kappa. So this thing called the Scouten identity. In this case, it's telling you that B alpha, B prime, kappa, is equal to B prime alpha B kappa plus kappa alpha B prime B. So then that tells us that this difference of the polarization vectors is actually equal to kappa alpha kappa twiddle alpha dot over B kappa B prime kappa B prime B. Right? So in particular, it's proportional to the momentum. And we're in Lorentz gauge, so that means it has to be a gauge transformation. So in particular, this is a gauge transformation of our initial choice of 
photon uh, wave function, uh, if you like, with gauge uh, parameter, let's call it chi minus i b prime b, b kappa, b prime kappa, e to the i k dot x. So in other words, I take a derivative of that guy, add it to this wave function, and uh, that's what I'm getting by shifting uh, with respect to b prime. The point is the choice of b prime has to drop out of gauge invariant quantities like the linearized field strength. And indeed, you can see that this is the case. It's, a, it's, 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 it's residual gauge transformation. So we fixed Lorentz gauge, but of course Lorentz gauge is not a complete gauge fixing. There has to be some stuff left over, and that stuff left over is precisely parameterized by the choice of this two spinner B. The only rule about B is that it's not allowed to be proportional to the momentum uh, kappa, because otherwise that's bad news. But other than that, it can be whatever you like. If it was proportional to kappa, it's like saying you've tried to pick uh, use your residual gauge transformation to go to some gauge that isn't compatible with the Lorentz gauge that you fixed in the first place. So, uh, Okay, so you can also, another perhaps more straightforward way of convincing yourself of this is just you can compute the field strength of this uh, uh, photon wave function, and that's just uh, a straightforward calculation. You get I to the i k dot x, kappa twiddle alpha dot, kappa twiddle beta dot, over b kappa, and you have kappa alpha b beta minus kappa beta b alpha. So it looks like it still depends on b, right? But here we have an object a two-spinner object that's skew on alpha and beta. Remember this rule that we wrote down yesterday. Anytime you have a two-spinner quantity that's skew, it means you can write it as something proportional to epsilon. So this is, in fact, equal to i e to the i k dot x epsilon alpha beta kappa twiddle alpha dot kappa twiddle beta dot B kappa over B kappa. So of course these cancel. E to the i k dot x epsilon alpha beta kappa twiddle alpha dot kappa twiddle beta dot. So crucially, <laughs> this thing is purely self-dual, right? So f twiddle alpha dot beta dot, remember our, in our duality decomposition of the field strength, there was a self-dual part and an anti-self-dual part. The self-dual part had to be proportional to the undotted levy chivitas symbol. That's the only thing we get here. So this is just i e to the i k dot x kappa twiddle alpha dot kappa twiddle beta dot. And the anti-self-dual part is zero. So that checks out with what we were hoping to accomplish because if this was really a positive helicity Photon, it shouldn't have picked up some negative helicity or anti self dual part um, in its field string. So, uh, what board am I on? Back over here. Now, you can also observe that straight away that f twiddle alpha dot beta dot automatically solves the helicity plus one zero rest mass equation. Right? So what is that equation? It's where I contract in with one derivative and contract on the dotted spinner indices. Derivative brings down a momentum. 
the momentum gets contracted with itself and I get zero. So observe that d alpha dot, uh, let's say, gamma alpha dot, f twiddle alpha dot beta dot, this is equal to zero. So the positive photon is a zero rest mass field. And you can amuse yourselves by going through, say, the same calculation with a negative velocity uh, photon wave function. See that you'll get not an f twiddle alpha dot beta dot, but an f alpha beta, which will add automatically satisfy uh, the zero rest mass equations. OK, so now on to the, are we sure we're OK to keep going here? All right. Uh, so uh, now let's get on to the, the real money maker, the Penrose uh, transform. So to talk about what this is, we need to introduce uh, some words, some terminology. May I ask? Uh, Please. Yeah, I mean, so I've, I've gone through this for Maxwell fields, but it's true for any helicity. Yeah, so for example, we would have mass of the Dirac equation that is also uh, transformer covariant to be decomposing somehow. Yeah, so then you get the two massless vial neutrino yeah. equations. Yeah, yeah. E exactly, exactly. So as you ramp up in S, the gauge invariant field strength has more and more irreducibles. But only one of these is like the kind of pure free field part. And that is a positive and negative helicity bit, which is precisely the positive and negative helicity zero rest mass field. So, sorry, one second, Sean. So the, for like, for instance, for a graviton, or a, a linearized gravitational field, you'd have vial tensor, Ricci tensor, and Ricci, say trace free Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar. But the free field equation is just the vial bit. And that has a positive and negative helicity part which would correspond to the positive and negative velocity spin to zero rest mass fields, but precisely the same yoga. Sorry, being very annoying, but the, the vial, the vial spin, I, I just found it alarmed by that. So it's got two, two upsets that could launch in it to go from the, the linearized. Uh, yeah, right, so there's this distinction between a linearized vial spinner and a linearized spin two field, and they differ by their conformal weights. Yeah, there's a minus two, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is an important distinction. Yeah. Other questions? Going once, going twice. Sold. Okay, so uh, we're now going to say some mathematical words. Uh, let curly O of K be the sheaf of locally holomorphic. functions uh, on twister space, homogeneous of degree k, where k is an integer. Now, that's a bunch of fancy words that means something extremely simple. Sections, you, you, for most intents and purposes, you can think of this sheaf as just a line bundle. And this is just fancy, yeah. Fancy words for functions on twister space, say f of z, where z are holomorphic homogeneous coordinates on the twister space, which obey. If you rescale their argument by any non vanishing complex number, the function scales like that number to the k times the unscaled argument. All right, so you see this symbol curly O to the K, and all you should think of is functions on twister space which are homogeneous of degree K. That's all it means. Okay? And
We're also going to denote, uh, need some notation for spaces of one forms on twister space. So let uh, omega 0, 1 of PT be smooth one forms on twister space, which point in the anti-holomorphic directions. What is that fancy terminology for? It means you have some f of z, which lives in here. It just means that it can be written as some f of a bar, some functions times an anti-holomorphic one form on twister space. So you see this symbol? All you should think of is one forms on twister space that point their form direction points in the barred the anti-holomorphic uh, direction. I hear this notation does not mean that they only de de depend on the zinc that they can also No, <laughs> indeed, I'm, uh, yeah, so, so Z, you should think of it as shorthand for Z and Z bar. However, that scaling is only R and not R bar, mm -hmm. right? So that's the sense in which they're locally holomorphic. Okay. So now we say that some F which, uh, oh, sorry, let me define one more thing. We then say, uh, we let omega zero one P T comma curly O K be the zero one forms on P T homogeneous uh, of weight K, so all that means is I have an F, which is a zero one form. I rescale the arguments of that zero one form by some non-vanishing complex number, and I get that non-vanishing complex number to the power K, okay? So this is, this is all we mean with these symbols. Zero one forms, one forms that point in the anti-holomorphic direction, which have some scaling property. They're homogeneous of degree K, okay? So a mathematician will tell you that this is some kind of sheaf valued differential forms, but for our intents and purposes, that's uh, good enough to think of it in this way. Now we say that uh, one of these homogeneous zero one forms on twister space is holomorphic if it's annihilated uh, by the anti-holomorphic Dolbo operator. So what do those words mean? Where d bar, this is just equal to d z bar a bar d by d z bar a bar. So it's an anti-holomorphic derivative in, an anti in the anti-holomorphic directions. And by the property, the skew symmetry of the wedge product and the commutativity of partial derivatives, it's nilpotent. So for those of us who've had complex or differential geometry classes. You've probably seen statements like this before, but you can uh, prove it, convince yourself of it straightforwardly when, just by knowing that uh, when you wedge, the, the exterior derivatives don't commute. They multiply each other by the wedge product. Okay, so more generally, you should think of this d-bar operator as something that takes you from pq forms to pq plus one forms, where my notation here is that omega PQ is some P plus Q form, where P of the form directions point in the DZ directions, and Q of them point in the DZ bar direction. Okay? So we say that a homo homo homogeneous of weight K zero one form on twister space is holomorphic if it's annihilated by this D bar operator. This is like the Cauchy Riemann equations for a differential form.
Now, because this d bar operator squares to zero, it's clear that if you have some f, which is a zero one form uh, of weight k, and you can write it as d bar of some g, where g is a smooth function that's homogeneous of degree k, then d bar of f is holomorphic automatically. Right? That just follows by the nilpotency of this d bar operator. So then this motivates us to define uh, the cohomology group more specifically the Dolbeau cohomology group, which we'll denote by H01 PT. So we look at this as a Z1 form? Or? Right, so this is a, this is a function, uh, a smooth section of OK. I hit it with D bar and I get a 0, 1 form. So if I, if I have a, an F in omega 0, 1 that's defined in this way, then that F is automatically holomorphic. Does it make sense? Yeah, that's cool. When you define a weight for a one form, is it a weight of a coefficient? Or no, a it's for the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, crucial, yeah. So this, uh, again, these symbols are just shorthand for the set of all Fs in omega zero one on twister space, homogeneous of degree k, let's make that intelligible, which are holomorphic modulo the f's in omega zero one pt ok, which are exact. OK? Nothing more or less complicated than this. So if you like elements of this cohomology group, they come with some, you could think of it almost as a gauge invariance. You're allowed to shift them by d bar of something but you shouldn't consider that as a different element of this cohomology group. That's all it's telling you. Yeah, so we're basically quashing by this freedom of algebra. Exactly. You're, you're, you're taking, so what you might say is you're taking closed differential forms and you're quotienting by exact ones. That's all it means. So if you've met Durham cohomology before, it's the exact same thing except you just have a one here. And instead of d bar, you just have the exterior derivative. But this is somehow a kind of holomorphic version of that. Okay, so then uh, the, the punchline, so to speak, is the following theorem. Uh, I guess due to Penrose initially, but the proof is due to East, Eastwood, Penrose, and Wells. And this is that the set of zero rest mass fields on complexified Minkowski space of helicity H is isomorphic to the cohomology group H01 PT curly O 2H minus 2. Okay. Now, there's a couple of details I've brushed under the rug here. There's some assumption of regularity that's implicit here in the definition of what you mean by zero rest mass field. So maybe you could write down something that is in the kernel of a zero rest mass field operator but has some really wild, gnarly singularities that might not be covered by this. But basically, anything you could want to deal with uh, is in here. And you can just take a second to reflect on how uh, kind of surprising this is. <laughs> it's saying that you give me any cohomology class of this form on twister space, and I will generate for you a zero rest mass field on space time, so uh, a, a, free, a free field. But not only that, every zero rest mass field arises in this way. So this is an isomorphism, it's a one to one correspondence. Okay, so in the last uh, couple of minutes, I'll just say some words about how this works in practice. Proving this theorem um, is not easy, it's an exercise in. Um, in homological algebra in some sense, uh, which I will not go through, <laughs> don't worry. Um, but there's some elements of it that are, that are very intuitive and useful.
So it's sort of easy uh, to show one direction. Uh, of this isomorphism, of this isomorphism, or of the theorem. So let's take uh, take some f. Suppose we're given a cohomology class of the appropriate weight. Then we can build the zero rest mass fields explicitly in the following way. So if h is less than zero, we'll have phi alpha one alpha 2 h, so let's say h less than 0, um, of x. And this is given by taking an integral over the twister line associated to this point x. And then we take lambda d lambda. So here lambda, remember, is the, the second half of the homogeneous coordinates on twister space. And we wedge that with lambda alpha 1, lambda alpha 2 h. Then we take our cohomology class and we restrict it to the twister line. What that means is that f of z restricted to x just means I impose the incidence relations on the argument. So that just means that I have f of i x alpha alpha dot lambda alpha lambda, well, lambda beta. Okay. So in particular, the integrand here is just a function of x and of lambda. And we're integrating out all the lambda dependence, so we're just left with something that depends on x. Um, as an exercise, you can convince yourself that this integral is projectively well-defined. That follows by the scaling uh, that the, the cohomology class had. And then if you take, so how do we know that this object satisfies the zero rest mass equations? So it's not, the wedge is not between the lambdas, it's between the f, which is a 0, 1 form. Oh, okay. Right? Sorry, good. It's just with, with everything to the, to, to the right. Good question. Um. So we can bring this derivative inside of the integral using the incidence relations. But we also have to include the possibility that there's some anti-holomorphic uh, dependence. So we have to use both the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic uh, versions of the incidence relations. So I'll raise this. Jiminy Cricket. There we go. Uh, raise this up so we can see. But because f is holomorphic by assumption, it's in this cohomology class, this term isn't there. And we only have this term. But here we have a lambda alpha 1 contracted with a lambda alpha 1. It's a symmetric object contracted by an anti-symmetric inner product. And this is 0. So by construction, we've taken a cohomology class on twister space, and we've produced a 0 rest mass field on space time. And there's similar integral formulae for positive and negative helicity uh, as well. Um, in the lecture notes, uh, which I guess you'll get later today, there's a worked example of doing this to construct the photon momentum eigenstates that we wrote down earlier. And in general, in practice, the business end of using this theorem is saying, well, there's some representation of a zero rest mass field that I want on spacetime, a momentum eigenstate, or one of these conformal primary wave functions that Sabrina is going to tell you about later in the week. And then the job of the twister theorist is to use this yoga of the Penrose transform to cook up a cohomology representative that when you wang it into one of these formulas gives you the appropriate wave function on space time. And like I say, in the lecture notes, there's some worked example of this for momentum eigenstates of photons. But uh, yeah, lunchtime, picture time, uh, thank you.
Okay, so please come down here to the blackboard. So we take, we will stand here and the picture will be taken from above. We have a nice background then.